Therefore, it is time for a question period. The member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Housing. I've heard from many young families about their dream of buying their first home, only to be outbid time and time again. Why has the dream of home ownership become so much more difficult? Because this government's burdensome regulation and red tape, the supply of houses doesn't meet the demand. In fact, if no new houses went onto the market after today, the supply would be gone in one month. Mr. Speaker, it's time the government gets out their scissors and truly starts cutting red tape. Here, here. Will, the men, will the Liberals commit to slashing red tape and letting the housing market meet the demands we need? Thank you, Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, Speaker, as uh, we've uh, repeated, uh, stated repeatedly in the House, we really understand the, uh, the concerns throughout the GTHA regarding the booming housing market. You know, we know that Ontarians are worried about, uh, about homes. They want the peace of mind knowing that they'll all have an affordable place to, to call home. Um, and I can say that, uh, that we have been working and consulting across this province and, in fact, across Canada, looking at solutions uh, that we can, uh, we can use in Ontario. Uh, some of those will be coming soon, Mr. Speaker. We've been participating alongside uh, BC and the cities of Toronto and Vancouver in a federal working group to, uh, to look at housing. Speaker, the Answer. Residential Tenancy Act uh, uh, we, uh, we uh, have been looking at, we've been consulting extensively across Ontario over the past few, uh, few Thank weeks. You. We're on it. Amazing. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, this morning I was joined by uh, Juan Rojas, who is in the gallery with his wife today. Juan and his wife and three-year-old daughter are looking to move to a bigger house for their growing family. They've been looking for months in Etobicoke, and based on their bids on the, house, on the housing, prices they saw the week before. They bid last week's price today, and they didn't get it. They never seemed to be enough. Mr. Speaker, can the Liberals tell Juan why they are making it harder for him to buy a house for his young family? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. It's a very interesting uh, uh, very interesting question coming, uh, uh, coming from the member opposite. Uh, I, I will tell you uh, that, that the former leader of uh, the opposition, uh, Mr. Tim Hudak, said, uh, recently said that uh, he congratulated the government for taking positive steps to address affordability. So we agree, Mr. Speaker. And I, let me just reiterate a few of the things that uh, that this government has done. You know, we're continuing to work with our municipal partners, uh, partners to make secondary suites. Those are the the self-contained residential units uh, uh, available more quickly, helping communities better respond quickly to renters' need. You know, we recently passed Answer. legislation that empowers communities to use a new tool called inclusionary zoning. Mr. Speaker, we have a whole host of things we've done, and I look you. forward to explaining more. Great. Final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government significantly increased, my apologies, the government significantly increased municipal review times for our planning applications. They raised it from 90 to 180 days for amendments to the official plans and subdivision and condominium approvals, 90 to 120 days for zoning and holding bylaws, and 60 to 90 days for consent applications, all of which make it harder to get foundations dug, walls put up, and roofs over the heads of our young families. Mr. Speaker, the dream of home ownership should be attainable for most young families. Why does the government insist on making it so much harder for the majority of the families? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Sir, Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank the, uh, the member from the, for the question. There, there is an interesting narrative, I think, that is beginning to take hold uh, in the GTHA around housing affordability. We understand, Speaker, very clearly that this is a real issue. But what I do want to say is, from our perspective, uh, in our ministry, we have been doing a significant amount of work on this file already, Speaker, and I would say we feel comfortable in discounting the following 
from being in any way influencing the price of housing in the GTHA. Number one is land availability. There is absolutely enough land available in the province of Ontario and in the GTHA to meet demand. And number two, there is absolutely enough service Chief land Government available Web. to meet demand. It is mandated, three-year supply required. We've done a deep, deep dive, and in Answer. fact, there is a three-year supply of service land available. Speaker, we continue to work farther on this to see if approvals are part of what's holding it up. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, Colfax Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Status of Women. There is a sexual assault centre in Brampton. It currently has 132 people on the waiting list, and it takes nine months for survivors to get their first session. That wait is about to get longer. Staff hours are being cut, and the centre is closing on Fridays. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister of the Status of Women believe that this is acceptable? Thank you. The Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise and talk to the member opposite about this important question. Absolutely, sexual violence has a devastating impact on the lives of survivors and their families, and it's far too prevalent in our society, and it's absolutely unacceptable. That's why our Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan, uh, through that plan, we're addressing awareness, we're raising awareness, we're improving supports, we're making workplaces and campuses safer. Now, we know that HOPE 24-7 does important work throughout Peel Region, which is why we have provided them funding uh, for sexual violence and harassment and prevention over the last 20 years. And in fact, of the 42 sexual assault centres in the province, they now receive the sixth highest funding allocation wow, wow. of any wow. of the centres oh, in the province. Wow. I think that's amazing. Now, I understand Answer. that their model of delivery is different, and we we are working with them to ensure that they get the funding, that they are Thank on you. track. Thank Thank you. Work. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, J. Paul Massey Singh, the president of Hope 24-7 Board, had this to say. Unless the province is prepared to step up in a meaningful way, we are really in a situation where we are going to fail our community. Mr. Speaker, is the government prepared to step up in a meaningful way, or will the Liberals fail sexual assault survivors in Peel Region? Yes, sir. Attorney General. General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Okay, and uh, this is this is a very important question, and this is a this is an issue that uh, that this government and our premier has taken a tremendous exactly. amount of leadership. Um, our premier is the one who stood up to make sure that we deal with issues around sexual sexual violence and sexual harassment in a meaningful way, not to just pay platitude, Speaker, but to actually take action. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. To take action that is going to uh, ensure that there are supports uh, available uh, for, for, for victims of sexual violence and harassment, Speaker, to ensure that we change attitudes when it comes to uh, sexual violence and harassment right. by our uh, It's Answer. Never Okay campaign, Speaker. We are making a meaningful and substantive difference, and in my supplementary, I'll speak to the kind Thank of you. supports we have available. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, um, Hope 24-7 has the second lowest funding per capita of all sexual assault centres in the province. Yet the government's tone-deaf response to this crisis in Peel has been that they've funded this centre for 20 years. But what's good? what good is this funding if it doesn't meet the needs on the ground? I know that the government doesn't believe in mandatory sexual assault training for judges, but now it seems like they're not prepared to help the most vulnerable victims of sexual assault. Mr. Speaker, once again, will the government respond to the cry for help from sexual assault survivors in Peel Region? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I hope 24-7 does important work throughout the Peel Region, but I think it's really important also to know the kind of support that we have been providing to this very important agency. Since 2003, Speaker, our funding for all sexual assault center programs has increased by 45 wow. percent, Speaker. And in 2015, we increased Hope 24-7's budget by over $31,000 wow. as part of our It's Never Okay action plan to increase funding to all sexual assault centers, Speaker, by 7 percent. Hope 24-7, Speaker, currently receives almost $500,000, the sixth highest funding allocation in all of Ontario, Speaker. 
Speaker, we have committed to reviewing counseling services. The member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. Thank you. Finish, please. Wrap up. We, I, we have committed to reviewing counseling services across Answer. the province, and we've asked Hope 24-7 to be part of this conversation. This is important work, and we will get it done together. <laughs> New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. People living on the minimum wage will see their paychecks increase by 1.7 per cent this year under the Premier's peg to inflation minimum wage. However, however, if you happen to be the CEO of Hydro One, you'll have seen your salary go up by 500 per cent. The people who need the raise the least are getting the most, and the people who are struggling hardest are getting the least. Does the acting premier see anything wrong with Minister that? Of economic development and growth come to order. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, in Ontario, we've had the largest job growth in the past 10 years. We now have more people working in the private sector than ever before. These are high-paying jobs, good-paying jobs, Mr. Speaker. Uh, many of the workers that the member op that makes reference to in relative number of sectors in our economy are now receiving more than they ever have before. And Mr. Speaker, was this Minister of Labour? Finish, Minister. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, was this Minister of Labour within this caucus who put forward an index on, uh, on, 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 on wages, Mr. Speaker? Now minimum wage is forever going to be increased as a, as a function of CPI, something, Mr. Speaker, that that side did not support Answer. and weren't even part of their official plans. Supplementary. Okay, so you're fine with that. Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> it's not just the million dollar raises that are unfair. After 14 years of letting hydro re rates reach a crisis point, the Premier promised relief. But she didn't mean for everyone. Their plan doesn't apply to hospitals, large businesses, or even municipalities. Why is the Premier only interested in helping some people, not everyone? Thank you. Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Ontario's prosperity, its growth, has increased. We're now leading Canada, we lead the G7, and we're taking a number of steps to diversify our economy so as not to be reliant on any one or any one commodity to ensure we advance in a new age economy, Mr. Speaker. That's high paying jobs, good paying jobs, stable jobs, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite seems to want to go back to the days of assembly lines and smokestacks, Mr. Speaker. We can't compete in low wages, which he's trying to propose that we're losing to other economies around the the world. We are going to support our young people. We're going to invest in our young people. We're going to invest in jobs. We're going to invest in businesses who create those jobs, unlike that member who wants to increase their taxes and throw and, and push them away. Yeah. Final supplement. Again, to the Acting Premier, Speaker, the Premier's priorities don't make sense. She rubber stamps multi-million dollar raises for hydro executives who don't need them and leaves people living on the minimum wage struggling. She's promising hydro relief, but schools and hospitals could actually see their hydro delivery charges increase under her privatized Hydro One. She could take Minister a step toward ending the runaway hydro salaries and runaway bills by stopping the sell-off of Hydro One. Will she do that? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're balancing the books so that we can afford to pay and invest more in education, Mr. Speaker. We're balancing the books so that we can invest more in hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We're balancing the books so that we can invest more in our young people so we can create those jobs. We're balancing the books so that we can ensure that businesses invest and come to Ontario. And they are, Mr. Speaker. They're creating jobs, good-paying jobs. Stop talking down Ontario and the people of Ontario who are delivering for our province.
Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock. No question. The member from Toronto Denver. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this weekend I received a letter from a senior named Clarence Bax. Mr. Bax lives in Sault Ste. Marie, and he and 31 of his friends and neighbours are facing a 31 per cent increase in their rent. Wow. Does the acting premier think it's fair that a senior like Clarence, living on a fixed income, should be subject to a drastic increase in his rent at the drop of his landlord's hat? Acting Premier. Minister of Housing, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, uh, and thank you to the, uh, the NDP for that question. You know, Speaker, it's absolutely unacceptable that uh, so many Ontarian tenants are faced with housing costs that are rising so dramatically, and that's why we've, we're already developing a plan to address unfair rises in rental costs, right uh, rental costs right across Ontario. Speaker, in the coming weeks, we're going to be rolling out our plan for substantive rent control right here in Ontario. It's going to be a very broad package of changes that will protect tenants. We've been working on legislation since last June. It's important that we get it right. Mr. Speaker, we've already taken, as I said in a previous response, we've already taken a whole host of uh, things in regards to, uh, to action. We've introduced secondary suite legislation. We've introduced inclusionary zoning. We've frozen, we've frozen municipal property tax on apartments. We've doubled the Answer. maximum refund for first-time home buyers. We're continuing to collect data to better understand housing needs uh, right here in Ontario. Thank you. And we're working with supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the acting premier, and I quote: "We are all senior citizens living on a fixed income." and are faced with the problem of where the funds will be coming from to pay this substantial rent increase, Mr. Bax wrote in a letter that he sent to Premier Wynne. Last week, the Premier and her Liberal Party voted against my bill, would have closed, which would have closed that loophole now that allows these devastating rent increases. Will she change her mind now? Will the government change its mind? Thank you, Minister. They had the chance. They didn't do it. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, as I said before, I outlined a whole host of things that this government has already put in place. I've talked repeatedly about the broad package of change that we're going to be moving ahead in the uh, in the days and weeks ahead, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, the Premier and I both have been exceptionally clear that we're moving forward with a plan to address unfair increases in rental costs. The NDP know that, Speaker. The NDP know that. We appreciate that they are on the same page when it comes to helping families who are feeling the pinch. But, Mr. Speaker, our plan will go further. It will address a whole host of issues around tenant rights. Simply addressing a rental, uh, a rent removal of the rental cap, Mr. Speaker, is a good first start. Answer. Our plan will do that, and it will do more. Final supplementary. Yeah, if you want to be on the same page, act now. Pass it now. <laughs> These seniors need the Premier to act, and they tell her so in their letter. Quote, we're asking you to support Mr. Tabbins' Bill 106, which would eliminate the dramatic rent increases we and 150,000 Ontarians are facing, they said. Will the Premier put aside partisanship, put the interests of Mr. Bax, his friends, and thousands of other Ontarians who are facing unfair rent increases? Will she put their interests first and agree to pass my bill today? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you again, Speaker. You know, Speaker, what the NDP put on the table in that uh, private member's bill was pretty thin gruel when it comes to addressing the needs of Ontario renters. It's a, a you know, dare I say, a one-trick pony. 
Yeah. I will say again, what we're bringing forward in the coming days and weeks ahead, Mr. Speaker, will be a more robust rent control, more robust legislation regarding the Rental Tenancy Act. We heard time and again, Mr. Speaker, as we travelled across Ontario, what is bothering tenants, some of the issues facing landlords. Our changes are going to address a whole host of those things. You know, it's uh, it's wonderful to uh, to hear the NDP standing up for seniors, but I want to remind. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. Wrap up sentence. Thank you, Speaker. The NDP didn't even mention the word poverty in their last election platform. New question. The member from Thorn. Oh, sorry, you're right. You're fine. The member from Halliburton Cortha Lakes Rock. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Labour. Speaker, on March 8, International Women's Day, I met with Ontario's longtime Commissioner for Pay Equity and had the opportunity to review the 2015-2016 statistics for the Pay Equity Office. While the Pay Equity Office does what it can to support women, it still lacks the tools and resources it needs to fulfill its mandate. As usual, this government loves to talk about equality, but when it comes to actually getting to the work that needs to be done, they are missing in action. The government has yet to act on the Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee's final report, which was published almost a year ago in May of 2016. Why has it taken the government so long and the minister uh, so long to convene a working group to review the well-thought-out recommendations made by the expert committee? Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much, and thank you to the member for that very important question. Speaker, we know the gender wage gap still disadvantages women right across Ontario and throughout every jurisdiction within Ontario. Speaker, the conversation that was started a while ago led to the creation of a working group. Speaker, they came forward with uh, some recommendations, and we didn't wait. Speaker. We implemented those things that we can implement immediately, we put in place. You've got gender-based analysis now is required when any time any policy that goes through this government, Speaker, gets put through a gender lens. We've been providing employers with this province, very progressive employers in this province with the resources that they need, training materials on anti-discrimination, developing other education products. Well, Speaker. The task force is meeting on uh, April the 13th That's as its first meeting, Speaker. I'm expecting some pretty good recommendations out of that group. I look forward to the Thank work you. of people. We're determined to close this gap. Supplementary. Well, back to the minister. Not only has it taken this government more than six months to even notice the report, wow. they have now decided to convene an invite-only closed-door oh, session oh. to discuss how ends. to close the gender wage gap. So why not bring this discussion to this yeah, legislature? Here. These are important issues that should be discussed publicly and not behind closed doors. Yep. I remind the minister that when the Pay Equity Act was adopted in this House in 1987, it was passed unanimously with the support of all three parties. It's time for this government to do what's right for women. I call on the government the right to work with all parties in this legislature and establish a special legislative committee to sit this summer to work on strengthening the Pay Equity Act. Can I expect the minister's support Question. for this kind of non-partisan initiative to improve the lives of hardworking women in Ontario, or will Thank the government you. revert to it? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the supplementary. Again, we're determined to build on the progress we've already made, Speaker. Everybody knows that we need the member from Northwest Glanbrook come to order. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. All members of this House, I think, share the feeling that we need to do better on this, that we need to close the gap, Speaker. It's not just confined to that side of the House. But I'll tell you, Speaker, when I hear the member opposite demean and denigrate and dismiss the people that are putting the hard work into this, the people we've appointed to the task force, Speaker, we've got organized labour, Speaker, we've got business, we've got advocates, we've got equal pay advocates coming forward. The member knows how to address the member in the House, too.
wrap up. Speaker, the member needs to pay a bit more respect to those people that are working hard on that issue, Speaker. It's not just this side of the House, that side of the House. It's the women that have stepped forward to serve on Thank this you. working group that are going to help us get to where we need to be. Thank you. Stop the clock. New question. Member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is the Acting Premier. I stood up in this house many times before to try and explain to you what your hydro crisis is doing to Ontario. Manor Cleaners has 30 employees with locations in Niagara Falls and St. Catharines. They're another example of business struggling to afford their hydro cut rates. Their hydro bills in 2017 have doubled. They tell me that dry cleaners across Ontario can't raise their prices fast enough to keep up with their hydro bills. And if they do, they can't hold on to the customers who are struggling to pay their own hydro bill. My question to the Acting Premier, will the government commit today to make real changes to our hydro system to ensure that businesses in Ontario have the ability to stay open and, equally important, keep their workers employed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister of Energy and Hydro Cuts. Energy. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Seeker. Thank you for the member for. The minister knows better. Let's uh, withdraw that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very pleased to stand and rise and talk about how Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan is going to help 500,000 small businesses and farms right across the province, Mr. Speaker. Um, not knowing the specifics of uh, the, uh, the business that the honourable member mentioned, um, if they're a general service business, Mr. Speaker, as the 500,000 businesses right across the province uh, are, Mr. Speaker, they'll be receiving a 25% rate reduction, Mr. Speaker. That is significant for small businesses businesses right across the province. I know, Mr. Speaker, we've been working with the Minister of Economic De Development and Growth um, to also continue to have a very uh, prosperous business climate in this province, Mr. Speaker, and that's something that we're going to continue to see Thanks, here in sir. this province. Our businesses are going to grow, hire more people, create more jobs, and that's something we should all be proud of. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell you to the minister, both ministers, that Manor Cleaners called me. I didn't call them about their hydro bill, and it's absolutely disgusting that the minister would stand up and laugh at a question I'm asking about hydro when hydro in this province is a crisis. Make no mistake about it. It's disgusting and shameful that you do that. I didn't call the employer. They called me. There's a real and serious problem in the hydro system in this province. After Minister setting the building on fire, this government time. wants to head business a pail of water to put out the flames. Mr. Speaker, it's not putting out the fire, and it's not stopping the closures of businesses right across the province of Ontario. I ask the Acting Premier again, will you commit to take immediate action to help small businesses in Ontario Question. with their questioning hydro bills by stopping the sale of Hydro One and taking real action Thank to you. lower hydro bills? Thank you. The member from Beaches East York come to order. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased once again to be able to stand and rise and talk about how all businesses, Mr. Speaker, will be getting a 25 percent reduction when we bring forward Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. That is actually relief that is coming for businesses right across the province, unlike that party, Mr. Speaker, that puts forward a plan that's pie in the sky, Mr. Speaker. Many of their proposals rely on vague, yet to be determined expert panels to be convened sometime in the future. I know the PCs, Mr. Speaker, don't even have time to think about a plan, but on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they have no idea on how to deal with it. This expert panel there is, Mr. Speaker, with the NDP. Have they heard back from anything yet, Mr. Speaker? They have not. Let's be honest, Mr. Speaker. The feds aren't even returning their call. Maybe that's why they're sending out the, the member from Bramall or Malton to go to Ottawa. Order. Order. One wrap up sentence. Mr. Speaker, so to see action to help small businesses, you look to this government, Mr. Speaker. To see no action, look Thank at the you. other side. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Oh. I know that our government strongly supports communities and business in Northern Ontario. We recognize that through strategic investment, Northern Ontario is on the right track to prosperity. Investing in the North is a critical part of this government's plan to build Ontario up by supporting job creation and creating a dynamic and innovative business climate. Good. I understand that through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, our government does exactly that. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about supporting job creation in the North and the work of the NOHFC? Good. Thank you, Minister Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you very much. You know, Speaker, in the late uh, 1980s, the David Peterson Liberal government put in place this fund, a flagship program for Northern Ontario called the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, and it has served Northern Ontario very well for almost 30 years now. Speaker, what I like to remind people about this particular fund is that in 2008, as the recession had taken hold, and in Northern Ontario, we had already felt the effects of that in 05-06 when forestry was affected even before the main recession. We made a decision not to scale back when the recession took hold, but to actually increase funding in this program. So historically, at $60 million a year, Speaker, we took it from 60 to 70, from 70 to 80, 80 to 90, and now that fund, Speaker, sits at $100 million every year and has continued to enhance and facilitate Answer. economic development in Northern Ontario ever since then. It's a great program, Speaker. We're very committed to it and increase the funding level by $40 million. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> The member from Timmins James Bay will come to order. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for setting the record straight in this House. I know that Northern Ontario is the top priority for our government. And it is clear that the investments made through the NOHFC are having a direct impact on universities, communities and businesses in the north. Investing in universities and colleges benefits everyone by creating jobs, enriching society and stimulating culture. Can the minister please speak to other investments made specifically at colleges and universities in the north? Yeah. Minister. Speaker, thank you again to the member for the question. We recognize, Speaker, that in Northern Ontario, our colleges and universities have capacity uh, to grow and to help our northern economies ride out the cyclical nature of many of the economies of many of our communities. So one of the things that we've been do doing, Speaker, through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is invest in research and innovation and in knowledge-based jobs that help our smaller communities ride out the cyclical nature of our economy. Just last week or two weeks ago, Speaker, I was at Lakehead University for a $5 million announcement on the Centre for Advanced Studies in Advanced uh, uh, engineering sciences, a major project that will create over 67 jobs over about five years. And very soon, Speaker will be a Confederation College in Thunder Bay for the ribbon cutting on their new technology hub, which will prepare uh, students very well for the jobs in the future. So it's very focused, some yes, of the sir. programs in the NOHFC, to help us ride out and change our economies in Northern Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, we've had three days of hearings into Bill 89, which is looking to overhaul our child welfare system for the first time in over three decades. I've attempted five times to put forward a motion in order for the Committee of Justice Policy to formally request the minister present himself at the committee. I'm sure the NDP member from Hamilton Mountain can vouch for me since she agreed that she'd like to hear from the minister as well. What's he afraid Mr. of? Mr. Speaker, yeah. would the minister please explain why his colleagues on the Justice Policy Committee are blocking the committee from inviting him to speak? Why is he afraid? Afraid? Thank you, Minister of Children. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to take a question here today on, uh, on this bill. The legislation, uh, Mr. Speaker, is a very comprehensive piece of legislation mm -hmm. that I believe will give young people the best uh, start to life that they possibly can have. Uh, we know that here in the province of Ontario, we want to make sure that uh, young people can transition into adulthood and find uh, success here in the province. And we also need to make sure that young people get the services that they need 
need uh, when they need it. So this piece of comprehensive legislation that I'm very proud to uh, uh, that it's being debated here in the legislature, and I'm proud that it went to committee uh, for the three days, is something that I believe uh, will be a big uh, game changer here in the province of Ontario. And uh, in my supplemental, I will talk about some of the highlights from that proposed yes, legislation. Sir. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There were five attempts, and I even tried to set up a phone call yeah, with the Premier minister. Must not trust him After three committee. days of hearings, many questions anyway. were raised, questions only the minister can answer. For example, our Indigenous communities are expected to join the Integrated Child Welfare Data System, known as CPIN, yet they have not been told how this will be possible without the proper internet infrastructure in these communities. I'm baffled as to why the minister responsible for child welfare would not want to address yeah. the concerns raised point. at the hearings. Yeah. Good point. For a government that claims to be open and transparent, why in this case does the minister refuse to be accountable to the elected members of the Justice Policy question. Committee? Good. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member knows in the Westminster system, uh, the uh, member has an opportunity to ask questions here in question period. That's why we call it question period. And you can ask any question you want during that time period. We have an hour, Monday to Thursday, where members can stand up and ask members on this in the legislature uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am so proud of this piece of legislation. Um, it Minister. So again, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, I will remind the member opposite and all the members opposite that this is their opportunity. If they have questions, we have something called question period, and we're here today. Use the opportunity to ask questions. And any member, any. The member's not helping me. Member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. Minister of Infrastructure. New question. Member from London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Today, we see more and more evidence that this Liberal government has driven long term care to the breaking point. CARP, which represents 300,000 older Canadians, polled its members and found deep dissatisfaction with long-term care facilities. Seniors are not happy with long-term care today. They are worried about their loved ones. They have little confidence in oversight, and they see that staff are overworked and just don't have the supports they need. After, after 14 years in power, after 14 years to improve long-term care, after 14 years of inaction, when will this Liberal government finally admit it has, had, it has spent 14 years failing Ontario seniors? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. And uh, there's nothing more important to us as a government and a health care system than providing a safe, secure, and compassionate environment for our seniors wherever they reside, including in long-term care homes. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why, since coming into office, we have almost doubled our funding for long-term care, from $2 billion to more than $4 billion today. And we've also invested in health care personnel, Mr. Speaker, that since uh, 2008, in the last decade, we have added 4,000 1,600 new staff into our long-term care homes, Mr. Speaker, and that includes more than 2,000 nurses. We've built more than 10,000 new long-term care beds. We are in the process of re 
developing 30,000 new ones. In fact, we're almost halfway toward that uh, target already. Answer. We're investing in behavioral supports because we recognize the higher prevalence of dementia. We're making all those investments for that precise reason to have the best quality care. Seniors want to see big improvements in long-term care, not more excuses from this Liberal government. Wanda Morris, the Vice President of CARP, says these findings should be a wake-up call for this minister. Seniors have little faith in the oversight of long-term care, and they want standards of decency and care to protect every resident. Yet this Liberal government refuses to back the NDP's call for minimum standards of care. Why is this Chief government, government refusing whip, time. to listen to seniors and refusing to do the right thing to protect the safety and the dignity of every long-term care resident in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we require long-term care homes to uh, develop a staffing plan which is specific and reflects the unique characteristics and need of the population they serve. So we think rather than an arbitrary minimum number of hours or staffing, Mr. Speaker, which in fact was investigated by Shirley Sharkey several years ago, and she did not advocate for that approach. Rather, she felt and others have felt to this day that it's most appropriate to recognize that long-term care homes in one part of the province may have a completely different population than in another part of the population. And some arbitrary staffing number is not nearly as helpful or important as ensuring the development of, which they're required to by law, and the implementation of a plan, a human yes, resource sir. plan, that reflects the needs of those patients that reside in that residence, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question today is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Now, our government recognizes that making smart investments in public infrastructure is one of the best ways to stimulate growth in our economy, create jobs, and enhance quality of life. And for decades, Speaker, previous governments, including both opposition parties, have failed to keep our infrastructure up to date. And we want people in every corner of the province to share in the stronger communities that we are building, whether they live in big cities or small towns. And I am so proud to be a member of a government that is investing directly in communities through programs like Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, which supports priority projects in ridings across the province. And I know, Speaker, that our government is making an exciting announcement today regarding this year's OSIF funding. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, will he share the details of today's announcements with the President? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, speaker, my thanks to the member from Beaches East York. Yes, our government created the $100 million OSIF fund to provide all communities in, on in Ontario with a population of 100,000 or less with funding for critical projects. And every eligible municipality's allocation is reliable formula-based funding, but they can also all apply for additional support formula. through OSIF's top-up component. Formula. Speaker, today our government is pleased to announce the approval of 55 OSIF projects worth $60 million, bringing the number of top-up projects funded by our government to 200 since 2015. And after listening closely to stakeholders like AMO, we are also tripling the size of the program from $100 million to $300 million. Answer. OSIF supports smaller municipalities in a bigger way and makes a real difference for their residents. Thank speaker. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and my thanks to the Minister for the great work he is doing building Ontario up. Because addressing this infrastructure deficit is a major priority of our Premier and this side of the House. And I know that the $60 million will go a long way to addressing municipal infrastructure needs. And I also know that the changes to the structure of OSIF will maintain the program's role as a major support for Ontario's small communities. So our infrastructure investments are being made on a truly province-wide scale, with every riding benefiting from the $160 billion this government is investing over 12 years. 
But, Speaker, while we invest in our communities, the opposition seems focused on taking down this largest infrastructure investment in Ontario. We fear, and the people of Ontario fear, that they will cancel the OSIF program should either party opt to form the next government. Question. So, Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please outline exactly what the infrastructure programs mean for Ontario's residents? In Sorry, sir. The difference between our government and the parties opposite is that we have a plan and they don't, Speaker. And our plan is making a positive difference for their constituents, Speaker. The leader of the third party should know that Hamilton is eligible to receive nearly $33 million in clean water and wastewater funding, to say nothing of the billion dollars we have committed to their LR team. And the leader of the opposition should know that in his riding of Simcoe North, communities will benefit from $8 million in OSIF and clean water funding, to say nothing of the $474 million we invested in the mental health centre in his riding, Speaker. Communities in NDP held Timmins James Bay will benefit from $5 million in combined OSIF and clean water funding. Communities in PC held Simcoe Gray will benefit from Answer. over $12 million. Speaker, our government is working extremely hard to support all of our residents in every part Thank of this province. Well, uh, Requesting the member from the P and Carleton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. I've written and spoken to the Minister many times regarding the opioid crisis in Ottawa, a crisis which has caused almost as many overdoses in the first three months of 2017 as we saw in all of 2016. I'm in daily contact with the parents and youth who are struggling with this addiction. These parents have taken matters into their own hands, organizing support groups, holding information sessions, and raising funds for a youth centre because they feel that their government isn't listening to them. I've received correspondence from the minister on the high-level uh, things that the minister says they want to commit to, but the opioid strategy is either not working fast enough or it's not working at all. Will the minister visit Ottawa during the constituency break next week to meet with these families and myself to see their struggle and to commit to the action that they need? Thank you, Mr. Phil Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I first want to express express my sympathy for and compassion for the families that the member opposite is referring to, the families in Kanata and the Ottawa area that have experienced uh, such tragedies. And uh, particularly, I think of the 14-year-old uh, who lost, uh, um, uh, whose life was lost uh, tragically because of uh, an opioid overdose, Mr. Speaker. But that's why we are taking the measures that we are in an extremely a, a comprehensive way, from ensuring appropriate prescribing of opioids to providing uh, the appropriate treatment and life-saving medications like naloxone, to ensuring that uh, individuals, including youth, have access to uh, the supports that they need. We announced uh, just a couple of months Answer. ago $140 million of new investments, including in cognitive behavioral therapy, that will reach individuals who are at risk and that can support Thank them you. in such situations. Supplementary. I again extend my invitation to the Minister of Health to join us in Ottawa next week. Um, I know he says that there's a lot of money out there. But there are still many people that are left behind and falling through the cracks. Here's an email I received from one parent dealing with this crisis firsthand. Unfortunately, this has been a terrible week. In and out of hospital. He was staying downtown in a drug house. We found him Thursday. He was a mess, totally out of it. Marks all over his face and his mouth. Feet so swollen from either his heart condition or from injecting between his toes. We called the police. They took him to the ER and they released him six hours later. This mother was devastated, and she finishes with this, and I want to leave this with you, Minister. The system isn't doing anything about this because they are following the natural elimination of waste. Why spend money on addiction? Most will relapse over and over again. Why spend $5,000 a week in a hospital? Question. Can the minister answer this mother whose son is falling through the cracks and whose government is fa failing her? You, minister. Well, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, we are taking action, uh, including directly in Ottawa, and the Premier and myself, we've committed to a meeting with municipal leaders uh, specifically uh, on the opioid situation. But this year alone, we invested uh, one point, and I know the uh, member opposite is well familiar with this treatment center, $1.5 million to the Dave Smith Youth Treatment Center in Ottawa to support the construction of a new 30-bed youth residential treatment facility, helping more young Ontarians, including and especially young Ontarians youth in the Ottawa region, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
uh, and providing support to their families uh, and helping them to overcome substance abuse and related issues. This new centre, Mr. Speaker, is not a panacea, it's not, it, but it is part of a comprehensive approach where we have to touch yes, this sir. tragedy at every possible location that we can geographically and whether it is with regards to avoiding individuals from becoming addicts in the first place or providing them the necessary supports to, to, to leave that addiction, Mr. Speaker. That Thank you. Your question, the member from Winter West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. It has now been over a month since workers at the Canadian Hearing Society were forced off the job after working without a contract for four years. This means people who are deaf and hard of hearing don't have access to the 227 interpreters, speech-language pathologists, counsellors, literacy instructors, and audiologists they depend on to thrive. Speaker, no member of the deaf or hard of hearing community should be forced to go without service, period. Will the Acting Premier stand up for all clients of the Canadian Hearing Society, insist that no scab workers are used during the labour disruption, and ensure all parties return to the bargaining table immediately? Acting Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the question, because uh, as the member knows, contract negotiations are a matter. Uh, between the agency as the employer and the union, and I'm sure the Minister of Labour will want to follow up on the supplementary. We certainly encourage the union and the agency to get back uh, to continue contract negotiations because we certainly hope that the matter will be resolved for as quickly as possible because, of course, the Canadian Hearing Society does... Please. Carry on. Certainly, the agency does provide very valuable services uh, to the uh, deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, my ministry has been advised that there is a contingency plan in place so that there is Answer. continuity of services to these individuals served by this agency. Thank and that you. is my ministry's primary concern. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. What the minister should know is that the government plays a large role in ensuring that no scab workers are used during a labour disruption. And since you fund the CHS, you have the ability to force the employer back to the table to actually bargain for a fair contract. Again, to the acting premier. Late last month, Mount Sinai permanently shut the doors to their audiology clinic. For people who are deaf or hard of hearing, the scarcity of services in the Toronto area has just increased exponentially. But it's not just Toronto. Workers at the Canadian Hearing Society are on strike in Windsor, Ottawa, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and throughout the province. Many of these workers are deaf or hard of hearing themselves. I ask again, will the Acting Premier acknowledge the importance of these services to a vulnerable community, insist no scab workers are used during this labour disruption? Question. That includes management and their families, and ensure the employer returns to the bargaining table to negotiate a Thank fair you. deal immediately. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Minister, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, for, thank you for the supplementary, Speaker. Speaker, during labour disputes, which nobody likes to see, bar Minister. Speaker, collective bargaining is tough. It's tough by its nature. Nobody likes to see disputes drag on far too long. It's a shared responsibility to get people back to the table. Speaker, the province of Ontario has some of the best mediators in this country, Speaker, and you see the track record they have. Over 98% 98, 98 of collective bargaining is reached without an agreement is reached without a strike or without a lockout, a lockout Speaker, in the province of Ontario. So we're involved with this. We want to see an end to it, Speaker, but we'll take no lessons from the NDP. Last year, 18 work stoppages. NDP were in power, 139, Speaker. That record speaks for itself. Thank you. Your question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. S Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Over the past few weeks, I've seen some local coverage about the Minister of Labour's surprise visit to Peterborough. Speaker, the Minister was there to visit an information clinic for workers who previously worked at GE. 
My friend, the member from Peterborough, Jeff Leal, also stopped in to meet the workers. The media coverage and what I've heard from constituents in my riding, North and Quinney West, have been extremely positive. These workers and their families felt as though people were there to listen to them and to help them work through some of the troubles they have encountered as a result of their worker compensation claims. Speaker, to the minister, could you please explain more about the purpose of the information clinic, next steps in dealing with these important constituents? Question. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much, and thank you to the member from uh, Northumberland, Northumberland Quinney West for his question and the involvement he's had in this issue to date, Speaker. Speaker, it, it was a pleasure to work with the MPP for Peterborough, my seatmate, the Minister of Agricultural, Agriculture and Food and Rural Affairs, Speaker, for the support that he had in this that he bought. It was just incredible. Great volunteer, Speaker. There was Heather Brooks Hill, there was Marion Burton, Kathy Drake up Harris, ordinary people who have stepped to the forward of this. As a result of them stepping to the fore at the end of the March, my ministry organized a three-day information clinic. All the parties came forward that are involved in this very complex case, and we started an information clinic. The Office of the Worker Advisor, the WSIB, Okow was their speaker. Over these three days, these organizations were able to sit down face-to-face -face with workers in Peterborough yes, and were able to help them through. I'm proud of the work that's been done, Speaker. There's more to come. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I agree with him that this information clinic was an important first step. It was an opportunity to bring guidance on a complicated issue to the community all in one place. I will certainly be following the issue as it moves forward. I know the Minister of Labour is working hard to transform workplace health and safety in the province. Keeping people safe at work begins with creating a culture in Ontario where health and safety at work is paramount. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what else is our government is doing to ensure that we are working to prevent occupational disease in the province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Northumberland Quinty West for that question. Speaker, it's critical to my ministry that all occupational diseases are treated with the same seriousness that we bring to physical injuries, which we've done so well on, Speaker. The ministry has developed a proactive strategy for detection and prevention. It includes regulation, Speaker, it includes enforcement, it includes research, education, and awareness. The cornerstone of this, though, Speaker, is going to be a dedicated occupational disease response response team that's being put in place this very year. This new unit's going to examine, it's going to respond to all aspects of occupational disease exposure, and that goes from the initial report, Speaker, to enforcement, to helping the workers themselves. Speaker, everybody in the province of Ontario who goes to work each day deserves to, uh, to work in an environment that's safe, free yes, from sir. harm, and to return home at the end of each day, Speaker. I'm committed to ensuring that Ontario remains one of the safest places you can work on the entire planet, Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Your question, the member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Carolina. Thank you, Thank you Speaker. To the, uh, to the Minister of Energy, when Ontarians were facing disconnections in the middle of winter, the Premier said this house, to this House that Hydro One was already complying with a no-disconnection policy. So it's obvious that, once again, this government does not know what's going on at Hydro. Mm -hmm. Steve and George, in my riding, were disconnected on February 20th and 21st and had to deal with flooded basements and buying generators to avoid frozen pipes, as Hydro One had silently disconnected their service. Both had no arrears. The Minister of Energy says, and I quote, that the one thing they've been doing, Mr. Speaker, is enhancing public service, customer service. Speaker, is this government made of hydro salespeople, or are they actually made of ministers who will provide uh, proper yeah. oversight? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know lately the opposition have been bringing stories uh, to this House about individual customers, Mr. Speaker. What's frustrating, Mr. Speaker, is that often uh, the member hasn't contacted me directly about this issue or apparently hasn't even contacted the local utility to try and resolve the issue before bringing it up here in question period, Mr. Speaker. Last week, for example, uh, a member opposite raised the story of someone who received a false electricity bill after their house was tragically lost in a fire, Mr. Speaker. If the member had talked to me or Hydro One, we could have gotten the issue resolved right away, Mr. Speaker. 
When they learned of the mistake, Hydro One immediately reserved or reversed the charges, Mr. Speaker, and has promised the customer four months of free credits. But apparently, helping this customer Order. wasn't really that prior priority of that party, Mr. Speaker. Answer. I get it, Mr. Speaker. If you don't have a real plan on electricity, it makes, it makes sense to try Thank and you. focus on the problems. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. And minister, we have resolved the problems, but they shouldn't have happened in the first place. Right. Right. The, government, the government promises modest compensation, and at Hydro One we see outrageous salaries. The government promises no disconnections, yet Hydro One disconnects anyway. Only promise. Every time a story of incompetence and outrageous customer service comes to at Hydro One up to the House, all the government can say is, well, we'll look into it, or that. We were becoming customer focused, or Hydro One is becoming a better company. Empty promise. How long will it take this government to realize this pattern is it's a pattern and it needs to be broken? As a majority shareholder, Hydro One it is in the minister's duty and obligation to act in the public interest and fix these problems. When will the government minister find some decency to take some long needed, le needed leadership Question. and executive pay, transparency, and and customer service, while they are still the majority shareholder. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Always happy to rise up and talk about the great work that this side of the House has done on the electricity file, Mr. Speaker. For decades, Mr. Speaker. For decades. The member from Renfrew, second time. Never too late to get warned or named. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it's it's interesting that member from Thornhill. I didn't even get to sit down. Let's try this again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we're happy to actually provide solutions for the people of Ontario. That's what we do, Mr. Speaker. We act on that. On that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they have no plan. They have no idea on what to do, and that's why they come to us, Mr. Speaker, to actually get things done. And that's what we've done with the Fair Hydro Plan. That's what we've done on these issues, and we'll continue to do that as we build this province up, Mr. Speaker. We have with us in the Speaker's Gallery a delegation from the National Council of Austria. They are led by Karl Heinz Goff, the second president of the National Council. Welcome. That would be uh, the deputy speaker for those that know, know the translation. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 59, an act to, uh, to enact a new act with respect to home inspections and to amend various acts with respect to financial services and customer protection. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
members, please take your seats. All members, please take your seats. On April the 4th, 2017, Madame Lalon moves third reading of Bill 59, an act to enact a new act with respect to home inspections and to amend various acts with respect to financial services and consumer protection. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the court. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Nackey. Mr. Nackey. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoke. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoke. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yuri. Mr. Yuri. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 86, the nays are zero. The ayes being 86 and the nays being zero, to declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.